Hello, my name is Katherine. I'm a baccalaureate trained around currently working for a third party managed care organization. I am interested in promoting policy changes in order to increase access to care for patients and improve quality reporting measures for providers. In addition, I seek to protect healthcare professionals' right to autonomy while treating their patients for the best possible outcomes through a policy change recommendation. Today, I'm here to speak about opioid prescribing practices. I want to address the current opioid prescribing guidelines versus alternative policy recommendations in order to address the opioid epidemic in the United States. Opioid abuse and addiction to medications such as Oxycontin, morphine, and other prescription painkillers reaches all social, health, and economic classes. This problem cannot be categorized to male or female, young or old, making prescription drug abuse a widespread public health issue. Let me first quantify the scope of the opioid prescription problem by stating this fact from the Society of Addiction Medicine. There was 259 million opioid prescriptions written in the U.S. in 2012, which equates to every adult living in the U.S. to have their own bottle of prescription opioids. This is a staggering number considering evidence-based research has shown little effect of opioids and long-term pain relief. Healthcare policy intended to improve quality care outcomes has instead contributed to the opioid epidemic and current prescriber practices. For example, the American Pain Association highlighted under treatment of pain in the U.S. population by its campaign slogan, Pain, the Fifth Vital Sign. This campaign caused the Joint Commission on the Accreditation of Healthcare Organizations to introduce new standards in treating patients' pain. The standards involve patient satisfaction scores measured through a quality care survey called the Hospital Consumer Assessment of Healthcare Providers and System Survey, otherwise known as HCAPS. Scores from these surveys are then used to factor in hospital reimbursement rates from CMS. The Centers for Disease Control estimates that 91 Americans die from an opioid dose every day. Again, the statistic quantifies the opioid problem and how opioid prescribing practices affect public health. Healthcare providers are not supported by their administration policies or federal health care policies. Evidence in a survey conducted on ER physician opioid prescribing practices by Kelly Johnson Harperson 2016 support this statement. Physicians cite a fear of discipline from administration and patient complaints due to lack of pain control as high motivating factors to prescribe opioids. I evaluated the current CDC guideline recommendations opioid prescribing that focuses on over-the-counter pain medications, exercise, and behavioral treatments. In addition, I consider mandating the credit schools of health professions to provide addiction and pain management courses required for graduation. And lastly, I consider a policy change to revise the hospital consumer assessment of healthcare providers and systems, or the HCAP survey, to eliminate the pain questionnaire from this survey. From these policy considerations, I propose revising the HCAP scores. This appears to be the best option for policy in regards to costs and benefits. Considering that drug overdose is the leading cause of accidental death in the U.S., with 20,101 accidental deaths related to opioids in 2015, the United States needs to establish a swift but effective policy. Choosing to support this policy can enact immediate revisions to the HCAP survey. In addition, financial incentive to maintain high patient satisfaction scores related to pain management will no longer exist. Prescribers will not feel pressure to prescribe in order to avoid patient complaints or maintain high, high satisfaction scores. This policy change will continue to support the Affordable Care Act to deliver value-based care as health care providers will focus on the patients, will focus on patient care plan with the interdisciplinary team. This option encourages providers to educate, form trust, and strengthen collaboration. Furthermore, health care providers maintain their autonomy to make health care decisions without fear of legal ramifications. And let's not forget the patients who use opioids appropriately and benefit from this course of treatment. These patients will continue to benefit from opioids without the society's stigma and maintain their quality of life. This policy change has the best outcomes for patients, providers, and hospitals with the fewest trade-offs. Providers maintain their autonomy to practice and regulate their profession, 
do what is best for the patient, and make sure all patients have the right to care based on individual needs. This policy I am asking you to support will have both small and large economic impacts. Right now, the opioid epidemic is costing the U.S. government $56 billion annually and U.S. employers $10 billion annually. If no policy is enacted now, the United States will see a shift on the macroeconomic level in unemployment. In fact, the shift is already being felt by the manufacturing industry that is seeking out ways to automate work that humans normally would perform. Manufacturing employers cite their major reason for automation is that applicants cannot pass drug tests and retention is near impossible. Manufacturers cannot keep up with their production, so they must seek out alternatives. Even with a 1% rise in unemployment in the community, the death rate from opioids increases 4%, and ER visits requesting opioids increase 7%, according to a July 2017 podcast interview with Sam Keones, an author of the book Dreamland, that researched the opioid epidemic in America. So you can see from the information just stated how addressing the opioid epidemic on a prescriber level affects the U.S. economy. Now let's talk about the economic impacts on a microeconomic level. If this policy is enacted, healthcare systems will have the ability to change the culture surrounding opioid use and prescribing behaviors in the following ways. First, discarding the pain satisfaction component eliminates the pressure for providers to prescribe opioids in order to produce high satisfaction rates or avoid disciplinary action from hospital administration for low scores. However, eliminating only the pain satisfaction score component of the HCAP survey means hospital systems will have to monitor and evaluate the remaining HCAP score domains to ensure quality and collaborative care in order to receive federal reimbursement. Second, on the hospital level, Healthcare systems eliminate the risk of losing reimbursement funds for severely ill patients. Hospitals state an unfair advantage if they care for more severely ill patients, stating as a patient's illness increases in severity, their HCAP scores decline. Thus, less hospitals are willing to care for this population. Disparities involving this population would decline as hospitals would not anticipate low federal Medicare reimbursement rates. This policy is cost effective as providers are free from the challenge to maintain high satisfaction scores for federal reimbursement. Rather, providers can focus on a more patient-centered approach for federal reimbursement. A patient-centered approach to care ensures active participation by the patient while building trust. As a result, patients will remain healthier. This policy is also an effective way to align goals with Healthy People 2020 to reduce substance abuse to protect health, safety, and quality of life. Providers can focus on better clinical interventions through evidence-based care. This will in turn decrease ER utilization so healthcare providers will be able to utilize resources more efficiently. And I anticipate within one year of this policy change, healthcare systems would see a decrease in ER utilization related to opioids. In addition, patient satisfaction scores will improve in areas of provider communication and healthcare team collaboration with this policy change. 91 Americans die every day from a drug overdose. So it's not the question of if you will know someone who has died from an opioid overdose, but rather it is the question of when you will know someone who has died from an opioid overdose. Will it be your neighbor? Will it be your friend? Or will it be your son or daughter? Thank you.